This is a talk called Getting to Continuous Deployment. The getting to is the important part, not necessarily the continuous deployment part. We'll get into that. My name is Lee. I'm Lee Joe on CPAN and GitHub and various other places. I work for a company called Payprop, and we are a platform to allow real estate agents to accept payments, reconcile payments, pay out payments, basically a payment platform. We're originally from South Africa. We're the number one in the market in South Africa. We opened in the UK 2014, 15, and we are almost the number one in the UK. And we are slowly now opening in Canada and the US. Uh, I was, I was curious. So I had a look and kind of in this part of the country, we were kind of picking up a bit there. So we're starting to scale our platform in North America. Continuous deployment, what is it? It's a strategy in software development where code changes to an application are released automatically into the production environment. Simple, right? So yeah, this talk is more about all of the things you need in place before you even consider continuous deployment. It's not necessarily a talk about how to configure the YAML for some part of the process. Um, if you want to look at that, you can check a manual or go on Stack Overflow or something. Um, but I might show some of that at the end of this talk. And this is, it's a 30 minute talk. So obviously I couldn't squeeze that into 20 minutes. So I've expanded it into 50 minutes. So we will have time to cover some of the things we're actually using and maybe a live demo if I'm feeling uh, ambitious. And a small caveat is that I wrote this talk to give as an internal presentation to our wider team because we've taken on quite a few juniors over the last three or four years and they're not familiar with how we're doing it and how we got there. So this was aimed at them. I've adapted it for a wider audience, basically. And if you have any questions, just jot them down and we'll go over them at the end. We'll have plenty of time to do that. If you jot down the point number at the bottom right hand corner if you can see that to refer to that when you have a question that's useful as well and just a brief in introduction to me i don't normally do this but i, I feel that it's relevant here so i'm a consider myself a backend slash api developer Perl, python ruby bash c all that kind of stuff and it's largely been in the payment space and it's often been with bank integration so working with the banks or payment service providers, that kind of thing. I've been doing this for 20 years and I've actually only worked for three companies in that 20 years. So I've seen tech stacks grow or shrink. And these days I'm more in a, more in of a, a site reliability engineering role for the company I work for because I wrote or rewrote or refactored a lot of the existing code. I mean, so it's a 20-year-old company, so you can imagine there's a lot of old code there that we're kind of modernizing. Um, and I'm kind of on the side of when there's a production issue, I'm thrown at it to debug it and fix it and, you know, investigate. And in previous roles as well, I've often been involved in the deployment side of things. Um, so I've written quite a few internal tools around how we do that in previous and my current job. And I consider myself a pragmatist, not an idealist. And on that last point, I tagged this talk with the word quietism in the, in the submission, which is impracticality in pursuit of ideals, especially those ideals manifested by rash, lofty and romantic ideas, serving to describe an idealism without regard to practicality. We're talking about continuous deployment, right? So we need to be realistic about how we get there. So on the practicality on technical side of things, you need to consider a few things like what's the current state of your deployment process? Can you deploy all of the changes, part of the system or no changes without a maintenance window? Do you need to babysit the deployment process, manually restart processes, manually apply updates, manually deploy code, all that kind of stuff? 
What about the DB? Do you need to apply DB updates manually? And how long are these maintenance windows? I said I work with the banks. Well, we often get emails from the banks saying, we're going to have a maintenance window next week. It starts at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and it ends at 9 p.m. at night. And the rollback window is until 3 a.m. the next morning. And obviously, you can't do continuous deployment if that's what your maintenance window is like. How's your monitoring? And how quickly do you know prod is having issues? And who gets alerted to that fact? And that's a human issue, right? So on the human side of practicality, I don't want to be woken up at X o'clock in the morning because somebody merged something to main. And I like to have my weekends free of work stuff, like I'm sure most of us do. And Friday evening is part of my weekend. Um, I get, I in doing research for this talk and actually f some of the feeds I follow, there's, I often read about people are saying that you should be doing continu de continuous deployment. You should deploy, be, you shouldn't be afraid to deploy at five o'clock on a Friday afternoon. And I read one that was really interesting talking about how, oft how often they did deployments, including through the weekend. And they'd only had five or six outages on a weekend in the last 12 months. It's like, that's maybe five or six too many outages on a weekend, right? So there's no absolutes apart from the fact that there's no absolutes. So, and the FANGS SRE teams are probably bigger than your entire IT department, unless you're working for FANG, obviously, by an order of magnitude. So they can wax lyrical about the benefits of all of this, but when you have 24-7 SRE, it's, it's easy to say, you should be doing this, you should be doing that. You know, if you're a small team, it's more difficult. And Prod's going to have issues anyway when you make no changes, especially in cloud environments. This is some of the fun I've been discovering when I started working for this company because we use AWS. And I've been collecting some of these fairly modes. I might give a talk about those at some point in the future. It's so kind of by association, continuous deployment can never be risk-free, right? This change can't possibly have any impacts. I, I kind of disagree. <laughs> and you're going to lose a, an evening or a weekend at some point anyway, even with no deployments, you know, so reduce the chance of that happening. Think about when the most pod outages are. It's usually when devs are in the office deploying changes, you know. The Christmas break is usually pretty good, you know, Facebook is up, Instagram is up, you know, all these platforms are not having changes deployed. So just to kind of touch on what our infrastructure looks like, because this kind of informs the continuous deployment process. Long before I joined in the early years, so when they were just starting up, it was literally a single server sat in an office somewhere in Stellenbosch, which is in the Western Cape of South Africa. And it's, it's pretty easy to deploy to that. I mean, you've got root on everything and you can just send some tarballs over and do what you need to do. When I joined, which is about 10 years after the, stump, the company had um, started, it, it looked more like this. The details are important. It's more the fact that it's running on AWS we have some MySQL instances and replicas, and then we have some web servers which auto scale, and then some other servers we do other stuff with. The bits in orange are the things we deploy code to, essentially. And now it looks like this. So we have, we're using multiple regions, we're using multiple sites for AWS, we're using Canada, EU West 2, not the one that always falls over, EU West 1, um, Ireland, South Africa. So we're using, distributed cloud computing. We've also recently added daemon servers, so there's a subtle difference in the, the orange things we deploy code to. Yeah, we deploy to the web servers, the batch servers, and the daemon servers. And these are all auto-scaling. As I said, we handle payments and recon reconciliation for the rental industry. Um, what that means is we're quite we know quite well what our traffic patterns look like. And 99% of our site is not publicly accessible. You have to have a an account with us. A letting agent can't just 
sign in and start using it. They have to sign up and then go to, you know, into, uh, integration process and then they can use the site. So our traffic pattern is very much nine to five does that and then comes back down when everybody goes home. There's a, a brief dip when everybody goes for lunch and Saturdays and Sundays are very quiet. So it's, it's nice because we have windows where we can make bigger changes. And it kind of looks like this. So the quietest case, we have about 20 servers. So that's basically when everybody's not using the platform. Busiest case, end of the month, at least 100 servers. And as I said, that's spread across four different AWS regions. This is, to me, this this is small to some companies. To me, it's kind of medium scale. Um, it's, it's large enough that we need automated deployment. But... It, what I also find is it's small enough where automated deployment can cause problems. What I mean by that is you can start rolling out changes and it can have finished by the time you realize there's a problem. If you've got 10,000 servers, you can roll out to a small number of servers and roll back quite quickly because less than 1% are showing an issue. Oh, it's the ones we rolled the code out to. There's probably an issue with the code. For us, we can deploy the code in a few minutes and then we've deployed it everywhere. So we have to be aware of that. <coughs> but really the minimum threshold for automated deployment is probably one server anyway, right? Cause you don't want to be doing a manual process every time you deploy code, you want to, <laughs> you want to automate that. And yeah, just on the deployment process itself, started as tarballs when it was just one or two servers. And then it became automated by some bash scripts. And then it became a Perl script when I became sufficiently annoyed by the bash scripts. So it's now configuration driven, which is a bit easier to deal with. The future aim is obviously containerization because that's the way everything seems to be going. Um, so yeah, how did we get there? And what did we have to think about to get there? What things do you need in place before you even think about continuous deployment? And how can they help you or hinder you? So I've just got a series of slides here that cover the key areas I think you need to work on before you really do do continuous deployment. You need consistency through your environments. The same version of Perl. You can't run Perl 5.10 in dev and then 5.20 in prod or 5.16 on staging. That's going to cause you problems and you need the same version of libraries zip and modules same versions of the operating system with the same version of critical dependencies and it has to be from dev all the way through to prod because you know in theory we can write the code once and run it everywhere but that's great until you need to run strace on prod to figure out a regression or something not working as it should You need comprehensive automated testing. It kind of goes without saying, but I still see significant changes that lack test coverage. Um, I know it can be harder with legacy code or if you're working with third parties that don't give you a test server or it's more complex code, And but really you should do it. And I know that adding tests can have a large negative impact on velocity at least in the short to the medium term, but it pays dividends. You know, it should become a large positive impact in the long term. If you do it right, obviously. And to me, there's no such one, there's no such thing as a one line or one character change unless that change is only in the tests. And related to tests, you need continuous integration. So you need something that runs those tests whenever a change is pushed to whatever your remote is for your repositories. CI is going to need its own infrastructure. So all of what I said applies. It needs to run the same dependencies, the same operating system, etc. And how easily can you build that up and tear it down? Um, how easily can you rebuild it if you need to do that? And how close does it represent prod? So 
as I said, our product, our prod infrastructure can be 20 to 100 servers. We also have RabbitMQ running, MySQL, Elasticsearch, so on and so forth. How close does your CI environment meet that? Do you have the same firewall rules? You know, if you, we've had a change previously where we deployed something, worked on CI, deployed it to prod, it was blocked by the firewall. So these are the kind of things you find when you have subtle differences in your environments. But then again, failures in the CI pipeline are sometimes failures in the tool chain. But I prefer that to, I prefer, you know, a failure in the tool chain to be the, rather than the opposite. I don't want false positives. I want false negatives. And kind of related to CI, you need a, a QA, a review and quality assurance process. And anything that can be automated here should be, you know, in a test, should be automated. Glinting, all that kind of stuff. And you probably want to formalize the review process and apply it to all merge requests, no matter how small, but obviously with good judgment to allow exceptions. Again, like I said, no absolutes. And you need staging. For the bigger changes, I guess, depends on your QA process. If the QA team only accesses staging and they don't have a dev environment, then you're going to want to send everything there. So it becomes part of the review process. And also user acceptance testing from clients. So I say clients here. Our, as a dev team at my company, the clients are the internal users of the system. They're not the external clients because we have a support team that are dealing with external clients. That's okay. Um, and staging might actually inform the release process if it's not a trivial set of changes. So if you're making a big database schema update, you're deploying new services, then it's going to kind of give you an idea of what the deployment process looks like, what you're going to need. Maybe you need a maintenance window, all that kind of thing. Are you going to need an internal tool chain? So we have deployment scripts. Um, code that we need to write to deploy our code. Schema migrations and updates. So there's quite a few of these now um, for depending on what database you're working with, what data store you're working with. If you get big enough, you're going to need repository management. You know, the, the bigger companies have written tools to manage their repositories because they have such big development teams. It, become, it becomes a problem to work with those. And you're going to need monitoring and alerting goes with that saying. And you'll need an external tool chain. So you're going to rely on tools built, built outside of your company. We're using GitLab to host our repositories. Um, as I said, we're using AWS to host prod. These are built outside of our company. My only advice there is choose wisely, but couple loosely. I mean, it's, it's easier said than done, right? Um, somebody can make a decision that can become 20 years of legacy, right? So it's, yeah, we're using GitLab and AWS. And we have external tools for monitoring as well. So we use, we use Grafana, Prometheus, um, Kibana, the Elk stash. Again, tools that are critical to us, but written outside of the company. And you're going to need a rollback feature if you're doing continuous deployment. And ideally, you want to build that into the deployment process. So what we do is we tag every release to each region. So we deploy from Git, essentially. And when the deployment finishes, we tag it with the region, the timestamp. And then we know that this commit is in this region. So that makes debugging and rollback very, very easy. And we also use those tags to annotate monitoring dashboards. And I will show an example of this at the end of the talk. So if we see a sudden spike on a graph on a dashboard and it coincides with an annotation that is a deployment, it's kind of like the first thing we will investigate. Is this a regression or an issue caused by that particular change set? And um, sometimes we don't find these things until we hit prod because another talk mentioned it, you, you do your development, you're testing your QA and you're working with a small data set. It's not the real live prod traffic. 
which can be many, many orders of magnitude greater. So maybe you had a warning in your logs and you didn't spot it and then it hits pod and you get 10,000 warnings within the space of a couple of minutes. It's really easy to see that stuff on monitoring graphs. And if you have an annotation that coincides with the commit, you can quickly debug it. And we can also use these tags to roll back to previous good commits because um, we know that the previous state, the previous commit, whatever it was, was good. We can roll back depending on other things. If we've made a database schema change, then it, you know, it could be more difficult. And if you release frequently, so you, we do, we do this many times a day. It's, it's easier to roll back because it's a, a set of small change sets. It's not massive releases. And yeah, you need to think about the database for um, complex deployments. I mean, the database is often the pain point for deployments. Um, feature flags can maybe help. Still going to need to babysit significant schema changes if you're working with a database that is many, many terabytes or whatever, and you need to change a table. And that's going to take many hours. You can't. You have to think about how you're going to deploy the code. Try and write them in a no downtime approach. So we we try to take the approach of making the code backwards and forwards compatible. And once we're happy that things are out, things are working, we can then deploy the change to remove the dependency on the backwards compatible stuff. And then we can remove whatever it was. So it's it's kind of a stage rollout, but it's with no downtime. For us, we, as I mentioned at the start, we kind of lucky in that our traffic patterns allow us to deploy some of these more impacting changes at quieter times of the month. And also because we're in different time zones, we have two, three hours where, where we can also deploy this, these changes. So in, when I'm in the Swiss office at 10 o'clock in the morning, it's three o'clock in the morning in the US. So we know that we can send something there because nobody's using the platform at three o'clock in the morning. Um, so that's quite a good, a good thing for us. And you're gonna need to, you need to check stuff once it hits production. Um, it's quite easy with continuous deployment to make changes, merge them, they get tested, they're good, they go out and your work is not yet done. You need to verify those changes. So how do the original developers know that their code has been deployed? So if you're working with a large team and you have a team that's doing the deployments, there can be a bit of a gap in knowing that my code has gone out. What we do is actually we send notifications to Slack and we also get emails which kind of archive it. So we have a deployment channel and that every time the deployment process ends, it tags the GitHub repo and it sends out a list of merge commits or commits that went out in that deployment to the Slack channel. Um, so we can see what's gone out. How are you going to verify those changes? Well, we have internal accounts on the platform. And as I said, we have the monitoring graphs where we can see big problems quite quickly. So you need to continuously deploy all the internal things first. So the tool chain, documentation, tests. Um, it's a good proof of concept. And internal tools probably don't affect the bottom line. Um, breaking your dev environment is probably, it's annoying to your devs, but at least it's not prod. You know, it's not affecting your users of the platform. And it's probably not time critical. Like I say, it's an annoyance more than a problem. And you probably don't have to fix them out of office hours. So if your staging server breaks over the weekend, well, I'll fix that when I get back in on Monday morning. I don't need to waste my weekend doing that. But if you're doing that, you're deploying the internal things first. It, it kind of encourages development of the tool chain. which can be a good thing because as developers, we want to work with a nice tool chain, whether that be internal or external. So how far have we got a paper up? 
So we do have full continuous deployment and internal tools. This is things like um, our translation platform. So we, we have a platform that localizes all of the, the template toolkit templates. That's all in, that's all continuously deployed. DB extract backup scripts and the deployment scripts themselves, which is kind of meta. So the deployment scripts are continuously deployed. And we have, I term this semi-continuous deployment elsewhere. And what I mean by that is we have one click to deploy to everywhere, which is kind of a nice compromise I've found uh, because it becomes part of the review process. The person doing the deployment maybe has to look at the change that they're deploying. Obviously, it depends on the size of the change set. We do have a review process and a QA process, but the kind of last step as I'm going to send this out to prod, depending on what you're sending out, you might want to just have a quick double check and have another look at it. I don't know how many of you are familiar with GitLab, but this is this is how we do it. So we use GitLab's continuous integration and continuous deployment pipelines to deploy to production and elsewhere staging as well. So these are the, the pipelines. It's a bit small, but I'm going to demonstrate it afterwards anyway, so it doesn't matter. Um, so these are mergers to master. And then we have this set of pipeline, this pipeline, which is a set of jobs that send the code out to various places. And if you click through that, it's broken down by smaller jobs. Um, one of the nice things we do is the test stage here is broken up into several smaller jobs. So we have a doc container that runs all of the unit tests, the integration tests, internal tests, sanity tests. It's all split out. So it's a nice parallelization of the, the test code, the, the test suite. Um, I will go into this in more detail in, in a couple of minutes. And we get with GitLab, we get the, the output of the deployment process and it's there for us to look at if there's an issue, um, what's gone out. Um, and that's there. Again, that's tagged against every commit where we've done it. Okay, so I said questions are bonus slides, but I have a good 10, 15 minutes left. So what I figure I'd do is kind of just in a bit more detail show some of the GitLab um, pipelines and some of the other tools we're using that I mentioned. So what I'm going to do is stop mirroring my, not start mirroring my screen. So let me do this. Uh, it's a 3D TV apparently. Okay. Right, so the, the first thing I'm going to show is the the dashboards we use for monitoring our production environment. So this is uh, Grafana, it's getting stuff from Prometheus, from some logs. And as I said, I'm kind of in an SRE rule, so I have this on a monitor somewhere. And we, we have all these thresholds set where it will, if there's primary CPU on the, if the database primary CPU spikes and I see it immediately. Um, it's relatively quiet at the moment because it's now, I guess it's past midnight almost in Europe. Uh, so there's not really much happening on the platform. Um, what is useful to demonstrate here is I said, we, we annotate releases. I know something has been released today. So if I go back 12 hours, I can actually see when things have been released. Um, so if I hover over one of these, I can get I can get the delta essentially. If, so if I had a spike on the graph, I can jump in and see what the change was. This was a looks like a lot of template changes. Um, that's really useful because often when problems start happening on prod, the first question is what caused that? And you don't want to waste too much time trying to figure that out. So if I get a spike on the errors here, I can immediately, and it coincides with a deployment. The first 
suspect is the code that's just gone out. Um, if there's no deployment happening, then it's okay. Is there something problematic on the prod infrastructure? Um, or, oh, I see a spike on the database at the same time. It's maybe the DB is running slow. So this is absolutely key, I find, for having a continuous deployment process because there's going to be issues eventually. Just to touch on the, the pipelines in GitLab. So this is what we have here. There's some build process that happens, and then we run the entire test suite. And we do have this pre-deploy step here. What that does is it looks at the change set and if it sees that there are any schema changes, any, any changes to the database, because we put those in .sql files and then they get applied by another process that versions the database. If it sees those, it will essentially stop the deployment process and it then it becomes a manual process where you have to verify that the database change isn't going to take a long time, which has happened in part of the review process anyway. Um, but it also gives you a chance to verify that the code I am deploying is still going to work without that database change. So it's written in a backwards, forwards, compatible way. And then if you're happy with that, you can then deploy to the various regions. Um, let me go back to my slides. So that's about it. Does anybody have any questions on any of this? Yeah. What would I recommend the best path for learning GitLab? Do you use anything like GitHub or you use GitHub? So you can inst you can install a local instance of GitLab, or you can you can f find. Um, Okay, so you have an instance, um, and you mean in terms of setting up continuous integration and okay, so th um, it's going to sound obvious, but for GitLab, their documentation is excellent, um, and the CI. There's a little bit of a learning curve to get the CI and the CD because it's configured using YAML files, and after X years of doing this, they have a lot of configuration options in there. Uh, let me see if I can pull up one of our. Yeah, it's similar to Travis. Yeah. Travis is open source or Travis not any longer. Is it still open source? Yeah, so, so do you, I mean, if, do you have, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, basically, what's the strategy to get from, I guess, having a repo to having it run CI and CD? Yeah, you, if you need to start writing tests, and once you have tests, you need to get continuous integration up. And once you're happy with that, figure out if you can continuously deploy things. Like I said at the start, it depends on what your current deployment process is. Um, what I have here is the, these are our GitLab's CI YAMLs, which configure how the continuous integration runs and how the things are deployed. Um, and they're relatively simple, um, YAML files. Uh, we have refactored them because we have a, so many environments, but they're all sharing 90% of the logic. So a GitLab allows you to do that in the way that things are configured. And essentially it's just a list of jobs and then what each of those jobs does when it runs, if it needs to run something before it runs and what it does when it fails and if the next job can run, if the previous job failed and there's, yeah, there's, there's a lot of stuff here. Um, like I say, I, w I would look at the 
documentation for GitLab. Um, if you if you're using GitLab, then you've already I, done I the hard work. Yeah. So I mean, if when you have when you have nothing um, other than your code and hopefully some tests, then see if you can get those tests running on a continuous integration yeah, server. Yeah, I, I am saying read the manual. I mean, that, that's basically you, one of the. So one of the issues with a lot of this is it's still moving very quickly. So I didn't really want to delve into the details of how you configure X or Y because within six months that will have changed, right? So, so yeah, it's kind of. Yeah. So John's saying you, they they had a system and some the person in charge of it left, and then six months later it was all different. So. Yes. It does a lot. A lot of these look. So the the GitHub um, the GitHub one looks very similar to the GitLab one. I'm sure the Bitbucket one looks similar to the others. So it's. Yeah, it's essentially what we're doing. We're using so our our deployment process from GitLab is actually running our deployment script on our deployment server. It's not literally deploying from GitLab. It's calling another process that sure. we have. Yeah, with a lot of nice a lot of nice tools built into it. Yeah, it can be as simple as just pushing, but and then the magic happens. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Any more? I, Any more questions? I think I have a good five ten minutes. Yep. <laughs> so how? Yeah, how do? You, how do I? How do we ensure that the QA team are more cunning than developers? I find that tends to be the case anyway. I mean, so the way, so way the way we normally do it is when when we have a feature request or a, a bug fix is we have a task and then we break that down into various steps. One of which is the QA step, and then they they write their stories about how they're going to test it. We write stories about how we're going to test it, and then. Depending on the scope of the change, if it's a major new feature, then there's going to be a lot more QA. Um, we don't. We have decent test coverage. We don't run to the level of oh, I'm I'm fixing a warning in the logs. We're going to run the entire QA for the entire platform. That it doesn't really scale. Um, so, how do we ensure they're more cunning? They generally are. Um, they do often send things back to us, say it broke because of this and it's entirely tangential to the change that we're making, right? So that's what QA are there for. Any more questions? Yep. Are, are you using page flags or what is going to roll up? And do you have like canary? So are we using feature flags and do we have any canary kind of stuff? Uh, I mentioned feature flags. Yeah, we do. We do use feature flags. It it depends on. So the use of feature flags is generally more for the more legacy parts of the system, um, because the test coverage there is is not as good because uh, it's legacy stuff. Um, 
canary things uh, not so much because we are we are finding the monitoring dashboards they're kind of our canary because we know very we know very well the our traffic patterns and we try to maintain a low number of warnings in the logs um we we're not necessarily picky but we're explicit about log levels so we we don't log something at error unless it needs to be acted on yeah. so if if we get a spike in errors then there's probably a problem on the platform so that's kind of what we do any more questions no okay thank you very much everybody